Hey, Hawkeye fans, Chad Leistico of the Des Moines Register, Dargan Southern of the Des Moines Register. We took you to the finish line for the second straight year to the national championship game. Um, Dargan's got to mute himself or this podcast is going to suck. Um, thank you, buddy. Hawkeyes lose to South Carolina. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 87-75. I think that was the final score. Uh, it's, it's been a bit of a blur, I would say, when you, when you cover the, the national championship game and the losing locker room. Uh, we haven't covered many losses, Dargan. Uh, this one was uh, pretty compelling, I would say. Uh, compelling from the start. Uh, Hawkeyes take a 10 nothing lead. You feel like, oh, my God, are they actually going to do this? And then as the game went on, you just kind of realize how much Iowa was overmatched. And I know we'll get into this a little later, but it just felt like it almost made you appreciate more that Iowa actually beat this team a year ago. It's 80-1 and one in its last 81 games with two national championships. Uh, it should, probably should have been three, but because Iowa has Caitlin Clark, it wasn't three. That was um, honestly probably my biggest takeaway from today is like with Caitlin Clark, it's amazing what Iowa did. Yeah, and again, you know, South Carolina, they don't necessarily have the flashy superstar like a Caitlin Clark, but um, I think you saw today just how draining and grueling it can be playing them because um, – for all of, of Iowa's success in the first quarter, um, you know, in, in the third quarter, they needed more of that and, you know, eventually ran out of gas. And so, you know, I think it, I think it was trending this way. I think a lot of people thought, I, I mean, everybody knew that Iowa was going to need pretty much a near flawless effort for four quarters to, to pull off this stunner. Um, but I, I think the, the vibe from everybody in, in black and gold post game. Obviously, there's sadness because there's such an important time and this program's history is over now. But I think everybody could hold their head high knowing that in this game in particular, everything was left out there. Everything was uh, the tank was emptied um, and it just just so happened that there's a better team on the other side. And, you know, that's that's often the case in, in title games like this. So I think Iowa uh, disappointed, but happy with you know, the effort and, and all it put out there today. Yeah, you just compare the teams and Iowa got zero bench points. We didn't expect them to get much. Uh, they were they were basically down to five players for the final four um, that they could count on. Uh, I'm not – that's nothing against anyone else. Uh, but they just – that's just the approach that Bluter took. They Their five best players had to be out there all the time. South Carolina had – Tessa Johnson with 19, Camila Cardoza with 15 and 17 boards, uh, Tahina Pow Pow with 14 points and three threes, Chloe Kitts had 11 points, 10 boards, uh, Bree Hall, seven points, uh, Raven Johnson, you know, one of their better players had three points, uh, you know, and Ashlyn Watkins, who had 20 rebounds in their last game, had three points and five boards. Like, they just come at you in, with such waves, and Iowa, you're right, couldn't keep up uh just i think uh endurance wise they go one for they had some open looks in the third quarter dark and i mean they uh they were in this game they were in this game even 80 75 in the final four and a half minutes they were in this game but they just the legs were gone the shots weren't falling this was not iowa's best offensive game but this is also the best field goal percentage defense team in the country so there's a reason for that and uh I actually thought I, I come out of this game again saying, my God, it's amazing what this this Iowa team did with with just being, you know, not as much height, not as much talent in a lot of ways. But they they got to the finish line of the of the, the women's basketball season, which was watched by probably about 20 million people today. Yeah. And I mean, you think about all that Iowa had to, to do to get here. Um, not just in the tournament, but the whole season. Um, it could have very easily gotten to the point where they get to March in the NCAA tournament and they could have just been out of gas, you know, mentally, physically, obviously. Um, and none of that was the case. You know, this team had grueling NCAA tournament games, had to, you know, it was different than last year and that they really had to go right into the teeth of their path facing LSU, UConn and South Carolina back to back to back. Um, and so, you know, you 
some of those looks that that often fall for Iowa when they when they don't uh, on the, some of those open looks, you can kind of see at that point, okay, this team is is running on E. And I, yeah, I, I think it definitely, um, if there is one small positive, I think it elevates even more the win that Iowa got last year over South Carolina because um, it took a it took you know that that was the kind of effort that they needed again today. Um, and so to get it even once against this type of team is, is pretty special. Um, and, you know, it was interesting to kind of watch Caitlin Clark's last uh, media obligations in a, in Iowa colors. Um, I mean, last year she was, it's, there was a lot of tears, a lot of emotion and, and there was some of that, but it, it seemed like she herself was kind of at peace with everything that had happened um, both in her career and today. Um, and so that was that was interesting to see because you could have certainly envisioned this big uh, sentimental, emotional scene afterward with Caitlin Clark realizing her career is over. But as Caitlin has done time and time again, uh, mature than most in just about every situation. Um, and you saw that again with her being able to reflect, being able to appreciate everything that she and this team have done, this program has done even though today didn't go the way she wanted. And even though um, Caitlin not winning a title is going to keep some silly discussions going uh, even longer. So um, it was, you know, it, it, it was, it was a, a respectable effort to end on, especially with all, all that's been in Iowa's face this entire year. Um, and I think it really shows that, you know, there's a chance that the, the expectations, you know, going to back-to-back title games is, is tough, but, I think long term, the expectations for this program have permanently changed to where it's not just hoping to be in big games and and play competitively. Um, It's winning big games and being on big stages and doing incredible things. And um, obviously that all starts with Caitlin's energy and confidence that she brought to this program when she came here. Yeah, I mean, there's only so much like. You know, oh, if this could have gone differently, blah, blah, blah. Like, it just it just felt like the better team won today. I put this in my column. Like, Iowa had the best player. Uh, South Carolina had the best team. Um, and I think that was the story of the game. They end up with a 51 to 29 edge on the boards. Uh, all three seniors came out with 20 seconds to go, but they had not come off the floor to that point. Uh, Caitlin... Clark, Gabby Marshall, Kate Martin, the three seniors uh, play 39-40. Caitlin ends up with 30 points, eight boards, five assists in her Hawkeye finale. Uh, Kate Martin, you know, I thought played really well, 16 points, five boards. Sydney Fulter, uh, 12 points, uh, had some some nice moments in the game. Hannah Stolke had 11 points, nine of them in the second quarter. She kind of had a couple authoritative blocks in there. And then Gabby Marshall, you know, it, it was a tough 48 hours for her, which it shouldn't have been. I feel like that was the most unfortunate part of this whole weekend is is that somehow Gabby Marshall, who played incredible defense against Paige Beckers and did everything right to draw the critical offensive foul call on UConn because without her hustle, that moving screen doesn't take place. And to be the subject of... Uh, hate emails or messages, hate messages, I think is how she put it. Um, it was super unfortunate and super disappointing um, just for the whole world. You know, let's just, it's just not, it's not how a game, <laughs> that shouldn't be your takeaway from making the national championship game with a clutch play and, you know, giving 40 minutes of effort. But anyway, she talked about that. Let's go into post game. She talked a little bit about that. And just she was she and a Fulter in the locker room were the you know had the most tears that I saw. I don't know what what you encountered. I know Kate was really emotional initially, uh, and you talked to her. I talked to Caitlin for uh, you know, not one on one, but like I was with her side session for about twelve minutes, and she was pretty. By that point, she was pretty thankful, grateful. We'll get into some of her comments, but uh, anyway, I felt Gabby was watch the video. And I, th- I thought Sydney was especially emotional too. Um, you know, she didn't really have a role in this title game last year. She did today, and um, 
And then uh, we'll get to Jan Jensen, I guess, at some point. I don't want to leave that out, but she was had some strong words for Don Staley as well. So what did you observe kind of in the post-game setting, Dargan, for our listeners? Yeah, I mean, obviously, as you're walking down the hallway to the locker room, um, having gone through last year's post-game scene, you can kind of brace for it being a little bit of an uncomfortable environment. And it was to a certain extent, but I really thought that everybody in the locker room uh, – as expected at this point, handled themselves uh, professionally, gracefully, and all that. Um, and, you know, there was a lot of reflection, obviously, um, you know, particularly from Gabby and Caitlin and Kate, um, just what they've done and, and where they've taken this program um, in a few in a few short years. I mean, you, you, you hear all the time to leave the jersey in a better place than you found it, and it seems a little cliche and a little repeated, but, I mean, this – this group right here maximized that as much as you possibly could. Um, and so there was a lot of appreciation for, for what's happened. Um, and then, you know, kind of another interesting angle um, was, you know, I asked some of the seniors, Hey, you're turning this program over to names like Hannah and Sid, and obviously, uh, you know, more pieces coming in. And I think everybody is really reflective on, just how much has changed with this program to where, you know, the next wave of, of Hawkeyes both here and coming in um, are, are, are going to be able to carry this forward and have this infiltrate things for, for a good while to come. And so um, I think everybody who's going to be back is ready to embrace that and is ready to, to have that be a consistent reality and not just, somebody like Caitlin coming in and, and shaking everything up. Um, not to say that I was going to have any success like it did the last two years, because it's obviously hard to do, but I think the championship expectation um, has been definitely cemented with this program. Um, and I think you'll see, you know, the it's, it's not just going to fade away for the people who are going to be on the team next year. They, they've been at this stage now twice and, uh, you know, I think Jan referred to it. It's it's addicting to be that, you know, get this high level of basketball and be in these types of games. Um, and I think the motivation to to get this program at a point where it can do something like this again, as difficult as it may be, um, I think is stronger than it was ever before, um, just based on how much things like these this seem possible for a program like Iowa now. Yeah, as somebody who's – yeah, good stuff there. Uh, as somebody who grew up in Iowa, you know, I was six years old when uh, Iowa made the Final Four in 1980, and I don't really remember it much. I remember Steve Waite's bucket, but I've seen the, you know, the replays and stuff. But I don't – so I, this – for my lifetime, this was easily the – and I don't – I think most people out there, based on my observation, like the most joy and most – fun they've ever had with a Hawkeye team. Um, now I suppose some wrestling fans out there would disagree with that, but um, even like 1980, the people that remember it, you know, it was cool, but it was also somewhat brief. You know, they, it was an unexpected run. And then, you know, a couple of days later, your best player hurts his knee in the national semifinals and uh, you're out or whatever. But like this Iowa women's ride, I feel like, is I mean I they may they may get to another national title in my lifetime maybe in, in basketball or football but I I don't know if they will you know like it's just so hard to do uh, and we just saw that even being here like UConn had five players hurt you know like and on the bench like UConn's going to be a juggernaut again South Carolina like is not going away. Um, it's just so hard to do this. And you had the generational player. And it, to me, it cements even more of Caitlin Clark's legacy for me because what she was able to do and lift this team up, just seeing some of the some of these teams up close and personal, like on the court and stuff like that, like how good they are and how I hung with these teams and beat these teams. I mean, to beat LSU and UConn and – Give South Carolina a loss last year and then give them your best shot this year 
to the point where you're up 10 nothing and 20 to 9 and still in the game with four minutes to go. Um, I mean, to me, that's – I know I'm biased, but to me that just cements – it cements Caitlin Clark's legacy as, as the greatest women's basketball player of all time to date. And I'll, But it also cements to me – it reminds me that you don't get these moments often in Hawkeye sports, and you might not ever again. And I think everybody understands that. And it's, I think they fully enjoy this whole ride. Yeah. And, uh, you know, beyond that, I think what is most impressive about this two year stretch in particular is, I mean, other than maybe wrestling, most of the time that Iowa athletics has reached a stage like this or a stage close to this, it's been, you know, an underdog run or a, you know, maybe they pulled some upsets or came out of nowhere. Well, that was the case a little bit last year, but this team was one of the elite in the sport for the entire year, had no significant drop off, handled all that came with that, even though it was foreign to just about everybody. And so, you know, it's rare that Iowa is an elite member of really any sport. And for at least this year, you know, Iowa was, in those conversations with a Yukon and a South Carolina and all that. And so, you know, maybe it might be more fleeting than, than some of those dynasty programs, but I, I think it really puts the confidence that Caitlin Clark brought to this program on even greater display that it was Iowa getting here at least this year by being the team that everybody had circled by being the team that everybody wanted to beat um, and it was interesting, you know, Caitlin was asked, maybe not directly, but I did see a quote where she said that this year was actually even more special than last year's run. And I think for a large reason, it's that because this team met expectations that were sky high from the very beginning. They handled all the distractions that came to them. I mean, there were so many opportunities for this team to kind of mentally collapse or become exhausted with all that was asked of them and Caitlin's fame throughout this year. But, you know, other than winning a title, they made, they met every single expectation this season with a player who is not going to be forgotten by anyone for a long time. And I think that is, is why this whole run is, is being appreciated even more is because it wasn't Iowa. It wasn't plucky Iowa as it often is. It was dominant in your face, elite Iowa, um, and that's obviously, you know, doesn't happen very often. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned Jan Jensen, talked about her for a minute here. She she kind of piggybacked off of uh, some of the latest flap. I mean, there's always flap. That's what's kind of, I mean, it is kind of a, a blessing and a curse, I guess. You know, so much attention that women's basketball is getting right now. And, uh, you know, it's – but there's also negative stuff too. So, yeah. Um, let me see if I can find this quickly here, but the video's up, but basically she, she was asked, the question was uh, how Don Staley just went on the court and like said some really complimentary things about Caitlin Clark. That was the question. Um, and the answer was not what I expected from Jan. She basically said, I can't find the quote right now. Sorry. Um, I transcribed it. I know I did. Um, I'll find it. Oh, here it is. I found it. Um, she goes, I'm pretty much. So Staley was one of the ones that said she have, you have to win a championship to be a GOAT, basically. I believe, right? Is that right? Yes, she said yeah. that yesterday. and That's what I thought. Was, yeah. And Caitlin didn't win the Don Staley Award, which is pretty funny. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> I mean, it's just she, comical. Yeah, she scored. I think she, I think she ended up with 1,234 career or points this season. So that's 125 or 120 some more than anyone in history, 125 and anyone, but anyway, didn't, wasn't the best guard. Um, so Jan said this, she goes, I'm pretty much happy go lucky on my Twitter and I need to choose my words cautiously now. And then she like paused for a while and she goes, there have been few, if any, if you research that have done what with Caitlin, what Caitlin Clark has done that have managed the critiquing, um, She's 
bottom line, she said, she's really delivered about every game. I'd have to research in the history of history what player delivered about every single game they played and took them two times to the national title game. That's like a pro team over there. Pretty sure you could put them in the WNBA and they do all right. And then she kind of trailed off. I think she, she doesn't like to throw shots, but she was defending her player. And so um, it was it was just unfortunate, especially with Lynette Woodard stuff propping up today. Like all of a sudden she's claiming that she has the real record because she played with a men's ball or whatever. It seems um, to get dumber and dumber as, <laughs> as this season has like, gone on. Anybody who watched this game – in that first quarter, especially like, how can you discredit? I mean, she was one on five in a lot of ways and I'm not taking away from Kate Martin and Hannah Stulke and everybody out there, but she was the one player that gave him any chance to be in this game. So anyway, that was what Jan said. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that's another element that you have to address and, and factor in to the quote unquote goat debate is, I mean, I think, I think without question, no women's college basketball player has been under more scrutiny for as long as Caitlin Clark has in history. I mean, you know, whether it's Twitter, whether it's this or that, I mean, there's just been so many eyeballs on her. And she said, you know, it's not always been easy. Um, and that's completely understandable because um, it seems like everywhere she turns, there's a new controversy that, she had absolutely no hand in generating, um, which has probably been one of the more frustrating parts for her and, and all of the Iowa program is it's not like Caitlin Clark's up there spouting off controversial things left and right. And it's just, you know, this is a product of your of your takes. I mean, she has literally said been complimentary of everybody who has had a hand in making this game possible and getting it to this point. Um, and so for it to have, I mean, that just kind of shows where social media is at in 2024, that even if you tried to please everyone and tried to have non-controversial opinions, it, it's going to get twisted one way or another. And so, um, you know, I think that's whether she knew it or not, this, this has kind of been the, the, I don't know if perfect's the right word, but a, a beneficial lead in to what's coming for her at the WNBA, which as we can already see is not going to have any less heat or criticism or scrutiny. Um, and so for her to go through, you know, really this year with everybody on her at all times and to not have a game where it was, I mean, there was no, I, you know, we've talked about this, even, even somebody who's a superstar, they may have a, you know, a 15 point off shooting night or something like that. There was none of those. Like, I mean, there was – she played b better in some games than others, but there was never, like, a glaring, where is Caitlin tonight? And and that was that was while shouldering the expectations of being the key reason why this program was going to go anywhere and meet any of these expectations. So, along with all the basketball stuff, which people seem to forget that, you know, just – there was there's a stretch where – there's like a new stat. Caitlin Clark is the first men or women's player to have this or that. It, it, there was one basically every game this year. And so when you combine all that with the unprecedented attention that was on her, that no one in the history of the sport has had to deal with. That's just a fact. That's There's no debating that. No one has dealt with the pressure and the attention and the dissection than she has. Um, I think all that has to be taken into account along with all the incredible stats um, and everything else, because uh, for Iowa to get this close to a title, um, she may have been, you know, as much as, as much as there was a hurdle of doubt that Caitlin Clark had to, to get everyone beyond at the start of her career, that was arguably even stronger for this season. You know, nobody expected them to be, in the title game. Nobody expected them to go, you know, be in the top five the whole year. Nobody expected them to go 33 and five or 34 and five, whatever it, whatever it was. Um, so that just shows that she's been able to have everything in, in her face and handle it all. Um, and, and that's been for me, probably the most incredible thing to watch, especially when you realize that she's 22. 
<laughs> I know. Yeah, I just turned 22. Um, the WNBA draft a week from tomorrow, she basically said, you know, she's she's not done yet. Like, she's excited for it. Like, you would think she'd be just worn out and all that. And, and, and Lisa Bluter made a comment this week that I thought was really something to remember, I guess, as we go to watch Caitlin now in the WNBA is like it's really hard for rookies, especially making this deep of a run in the NCAA tournament. And like they're asked to go through what was for Caitlin a six month season. I mean, going back to the crossover at Kinnick uh, and 40 some games when you count ex- the exhibitions and not to mention the foreign trip. And now a week later, be on a WNBA roster and all the obligations that are going to come with that. But she embraces it. And uh, I think that also cements like also like why the WNBA was the right decision for her because uh, she has maxed out this roster, honestly, and maxed out the number of amount of scrutiny she can probably physically handle at this point. Not that she can't handle it, but like anybody, nobody should have to handle um, (laughs) the amount she does. So I want, I know you guys have probably seen this already because that's already got, as I'm reading this has almost 600, 700 retweets. And I just posted it not long ago. So, like, people are going wild about this answer. But if you haven't seen it, this was her final answer as a Hawkeye. And I was lucky enough that I got to ask her her last question. Um, I think that that was – I appreciate Bailey Turner for that. Um, I know that – and and, uh, she said something really nice to me afterwards, too. Like, didn't have to do that either Um, in appreciation for – how I've covered her. So anyway, she said this. I asked her about how on earth did she hold all of it together with the pressure? How did she hold it all together emotionally to continue to come up every night, as you said, play at a high level every single night, including, you know, what a start, 18 points in the first quarter of a national title game. I mean, anybody who tuned in uh, had to be just mesmerized by what she did and she goes here's the full answer okay she said uh oh gosh i don't know i don't get nervous for games it's crazy like it's the national championship and i walk out there and i'm as calm as i can be i think that's because i trust all the work i've put in i know i've been ready for these moments i thought that was a really good quote i know this is my last time and playing in a hawkeye uniform like there's nothing to lose we're the underdog go out there and have a blast i feel like that's what i've done I'm so proud of the way I've carried myself. It's certainly been hard at times. I thought this this is where I felt like it got real for her. To always be in the spotlight, I'm getting a little emotional. To have um, everybody's eyeballs on you. But I wouldn't change it for the world, the positive and the negative. I'm so lucky. I'm so fortunate. That's what I always remind myself. There's so many people that would want to be in my shoes. It's been a lot of pressure, but it's also been a lot of fun. And I feel like our team, this is like the best part. And I feel like our team has risen to every single moment, every single challenge. Just so proud of our program. Of course, she brings it back to the team at the very end. So I thought it was a great final answer for her for Hawkeye career. Yeah, and again, like this team didn't really have a whole lot of experience with these types of moments before Caitlin Clark. And so for her, confidence was obviously the igniter. But for everybody else to get behind her and fall in line as as well as they have and as successfully as they have, um, I think is also part of her legacy, both in the program and in the sport. Because, I mean, you see all the time somebody comes in, a superstar, and, you know, they may get their stats, they may get their points, but the winning doesn't always come with it. And I think – while there was some evidence of that early in Caitlin Clark's career, Hey, is this is the way she does business really going to equate to high level winning. But once everybody got on board on the team, I mean, you saw how much the the cohesion really carried Iowa to everything that it has accomplished here. Um, Because without that, you just have a superstar putting up points and, and maybe the, the big wins don't come. And so, you know, I think, again, she said it a million times, but that's really been the biggest growth for her um, in her in the back half of her Iowa career is being able to trust people and trust her teammates and not 
feel like she has to shoulder every single element of the program. And so um, it, it is interesting moving forward. Um, you know, everybody's kind of jumped at the chance to say, oh, Caitlin's, you know, going to be in for a rude awakening or, or any of that. I, I think what people are forgetting is she knows that. Like, she's very self-aware. She's not somebody who's running around saying, yeah, I'm about to dominate the league and own it. I mean, she's her self-awareness has been a massive asset through all of this. And, you know, I think I think the last year, two years of her being in the spotlight has her prepared to handle all that's going to be coming at her at the next level, more than maybe even the basketball, because um, she's going to be a lightning rod for criticism and scrutiny and dissection as she goes to the next level. But as she said, you know, she's very aware that that so many basketball players and people would love to have her ability and have her platform and have her uh, confidence, really. And so for her to to be able to realize all that um, as she's gone through many, many of these moments, um, I think really sets the stage for what's coming next. And, you know, as you know, it, it seems like the public perception is going to be in a little bit similar place as it was when she started at Iowa. Hey, here comes this player with all this hype and all this talk. Is she really going to be able to match it? Um, and you saw what she did in college. And so I, I think there's no reason to think that even if it doesn't happen right away, even if she doesn't have the best rookie year ever, that Caitlin Clark's going to find a way to greatness at the next level, just as she has here. Yeah. And I'll make a prediction about her WNBA career. I don't know how many points she's going to score or how many assists she'll have, but I'll bet you that she will make everybody on the Indiana Fever better, and she's going to be everyone around that, everyone around the city and around that program, franchise, whatever, is going to say, "Wow, like she's an amazing teammate," <laughs> and. You know, you're lucky to play with her, and you're lucky to to take the floor with her. I think, I think she's going to change people's perspectives as she goes, just like she did here in college. I don't. It could there could be some bumps, but I bet she handles them well, and I bet she uh, continues to excel um, on the court and off. Honestly, I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing what she's been able to do and the ride she's taken us on, even Dargan and these four years, but especially these last two. But now we get to go home. Uh, 11 nights on the road. We maxed it out. I packed for 11 nights in the carry-on. Made it. Saved the sweater for the championship. And uh, I made it. I still got one clean t-shirt to go. I got a, a shirt I'm going to wear tomorrow on the plane. I'm good. We're, but thank you all for listening all season long. We enjoyed it. Any final words, Dargan? Yeah, I was just going to say um, I, I like what you said about taking us on the ride, too, because, um, you know, obviously we're, we're unbiased journalists and all that. But I, I can honestly say that Caitlin Clark's fame and covering her fame throughout this year and last year has made me better at my job, you know, because you know that everything you write about her has a chance to go viral. Everything you write about her um, is going to be devoured by everybody and so you know it's it, it, it rubbed her her confidence and greatness even rubs off on people she probably didn't think it would you know the people covering her who have been locked into this journey the whole way um and so you know i i never thought covering iowa women's basketball that i'd cover back-to-back -back title games certainly um and but the fact that it it, it worked out that way and there was so many big moments along the way, um, I think made me better. And I think made a lot of people better who, who have covered her, uh, for the bulk of her time here. Great way to finish a man. Good, good ride. Thank you. Hawk fans, Dargan Southern, Chad Lysico. Thanks for joining us all season long. Uh, 